So um, I'm Amber. Um, I'm going to first talk a little bit about myself. I'm a PhD student at uh, the Institute of Neurology. Um, I go between the Department of Brain Repair and Rehabilitation and the Department of Neuroinflammation. Um, and I'm also the chair and founder of Movement for Hope, which is a charity that utilizes the art. It's a very small charity. We're in our humble beginnings. Uh, that utilizes the arts to raise awareness and funding support for people with neurological conditions. Um, how Movement for Hope got started, I'll just um, start with that. Um, I was in the lab really late one evening. Uh, it was, we were nearing kind of midnight, um, waiting for some things to finish. And I realized that I hadn't actually laid eyes on the condition that I was studying. And so I went to YouTube and uh, tried to find some stories and to really see kind of what this looked like. At the, mo at the time, it was motor neuron disease. Uh, I wanted to see what it looked like um, on a person because from the research perspective, you just kind of stay in these journal articles and you're engulfed in this sort of writing and this great research, but you never really get to step outside and see, unless you're a clinician, uh, to see uh, what it looks like on um, a human person and, and actually get to experience that what, what, what um, you guys might experience with encephalitis. And so um, I came across an interview with Tony Jute, and he was sharing his experience with The Guardian. And what he said was that there's no hope and there's no help. And um, because you know what the end will be, this is why this condition is so devastating. Um, and the real calculation is that you might live longer than what you might want to because your, your family needs you. And I find that this is universal for many neurological conditions, that people end up feeling this kind of hopelessness um, with regards to their condition because they can't see the researchers and they can't actually um, connect with any sort of um, hopeful outcome. And so I set out and I started Movement for Hope. But what I'm here to talk to you today about is uh, the brain, brain injury and creativity as well as uh, what happens in the brain uh, when, this is, when this is occurring in some rare cases and also art therapy. Art and science have this sort of innate connection that you can't get, get around. Um, and my job at Movement for Hope is to connect these two. So from, back from kind of Leonardo da Vinci, so you, might, you guys might uh, recognize some of these images. Scientists used to utilize art in order to communicate their research. But beyond that, the art was a stimulus for the science. So in the case of Leonardo da Vinci, for example, he utilized um, a piece of artwork, so for example, if he painted a portrait, he might watch um, the, the woman that he was painting or his muse and watch how the light hit her face and refracted off of that and then kind of develop a theory about light refraction from that. So art and science have originally had an innate connection even in, in uh, the science industry and just kind of bringing us back to uh, what that means for us is uh, what I hope to do here. I'm going to talk a little bit about some kind of rare cases and where brain injury actually sparked some level of creativity. And these are extremely important. These cases, although rare, they're extremely important because they allow for um, researchers to kind of get a, a greater insight at what's happening um, physiologically um, at <coughs> a, from an MRI, MRI level, which is magnetic resonance spectroscopy or imaging level. So this is Ann Adams. She started off as a scientist and she came down with prefrontal um, dementia, which uh, caused her to lose um, some of her logic ability. So she couldn't do maths anymore, as well as um, she lost the ability to speak properly. And from that, she channeled somehow her, creativ her creativity um, and began to, to become an artist. And she, she became an artist in 2000 when she uh, was diagnosed with prefrontal uh, de uh, dementia. And then um, she went on to 2007 until she couldn't hold actually the paintbrush any longer and um, went on to um, pass away. Um, Jim Chambliss, he, was, uh, he had a brain injury, traumatic brain injury, um, and ended up having kind of epilepsy. He started off as a lawyer and ended up as an artist um, following his injury uh, where he couldn't actually uh, do any sort of, he couldn't continue on with his job, but beyond that, his, this surge of creativity caused him to um, channel his symptoms that he was having, which was cognitive damage as well as 
uh, migraines into 3D art. So he became a teacher, a substitute teacher, um, and was in the classroom and realized after playing with kind of the, the 3D sort of molding that, that the children were playing with that he could actually do this as well and became an artist from that. Alison Silva, she had a tumor um, and this she, she started off as an artist, so in terms of what happens when, when you're already an artist, sometimes it shifts your creativity, so brain injury can also shift the way that you um, express yourself. And so her style turned into this sort of deeper and darker um, way of expressing what she was going through, and also it became 20 times uh, more expensive, <laughs> so she, she gained from that a lot. Uh, in the same same instance, this uh, painter, Anton, he um, had disturbances in, after a stroke, he had disturbances in spatial orientation, so vision, uh, the ability to recognize faces, um, but from that he actually channeled his, his creativity in a different route. Although he couldn't see as well um, or focus as much, his, his creative ability kind of rerouted in this sort of abstract way, and so his paintings became a lot more <coughs> abstract than they were before. And Sandy, um, she also started off as, a, as an artist, and she lost uh, the capacity for language and um, <coughs> couldn't speak. And so what she, she uh, got a tumor, and they had to cut it out, so they also took with that part of her left hemisphere which um, the left and the right, so left hemisphere, or I shouldn't say hemisphere, the left side of the brain, um, <coughs> controls for everything kind of logical and um, that's your sort of scientific side and the, the right side of the brain is your sort of creative side, as they say, <coughs> although there is an in interaction between the two. And so they took a bit of her, uh, of her logic with, with her as, as after that surgery. Um, and she channeled that through art as well. And then John Starkin, an, another case where he had a, sm uh, a, a stroke uh, which resulted in hemorrhage in his cerebellum, which is the um, center for motor function. So back here, which controls for everything that is um, kind of your ability to, to walk, to uh, coordinate yourself, he, they took that um, after this hemorrhage or bleeding in his brain um, and it caused this incredible surge of creativity almost like a compulsion um, and I would if we have time I'll have uh, you guys to watch a, a video of him if we can kind of connect it um, but this case in particular is they actually did put him in an MRI afterwards and um, they saw that the connections from the back of his brain the cerebellum had rerouted to his frontal lobe, uh, which is your area for kind of all things kind of creative, as well as what makes us kind of distinctly human. So um, our inhibitory functions and our um, how we, you know, if we get upset with someone, the reason our frontal lobe is the reason why we don't kind of tell that person off because <laughs> we have that sort of inhibitory um, response of being polite. So how does all this happen is what I want to get to. This is a picture of the brain and the different regions that I uh, mentioned. In the, the back is our, um, our cerebellum where we have the motor coordination. Um, we have this region of vision and the, the frontal lobe here is where our imagination is. And in his case, they took out literally a chunk here and his his, his highways of communication, or his axons, reroute it from here, from the little pieces of tissue, all the way to his frontal cortex, um, which caused him to have this sort of impulse to paint um, and express himself in that way. This is huge for scientists, uh, these sorts of case studies and, and others like it, um, because it points to two different things. One is called plasticity, and one is called neuroregeneration. So in plasticity, uh, your, your brain changes in response to um, something that has happened. So brain injury or um, anything that has happened chemically to cause it to um, make any sort of shift. And in plasticity, the, we, our brains are extremely resilient. So 
um, if you if you if we do get injury, usually kind of the low, the earlier stage, the earlier stages that you get this. So children are extremely resilient in, in particular, um, and their brains can reroute quite quite rapidly. But um, what's exciting in the research is that uh, neuroregeneration. Just a few years ago, um, about ten years ago, we realized or we found that. Um, as adults, we can actually regenerate neurons, uh, which is our sort of these highways of communication that I talked about earlier. So in our brains, we have these sort of highways of communication from our brain to uh, the muscles in our body. And a lot of them are wrapped with myelin, which is an outer coating that protects the neuron and it also allows the signal to tr travel really, really fast. So that, you know, if you touch a hot stove, your, your, the signal will go down and you'll remove your hand from it because your brain is telling you, no, 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 that's hot. <laughs> remove your hand immediately. So um, in a lot of cases, this sort of myelin sheath, um, in particular the research that I study, gets destroyed by our uh, immune systems or our kind of first line of defense when something goes wrong. Our immune system is activated and it's meant to be really, really um, protective, but in some cases it's not protective and it, it's actually harmful to um, the myelin coating. And in other uh, cases, the axon itself is destroyed and there is no message that can be sent. Our brains, however, now we know, can regenerate neurons. And so the, there's stem cells and different diff other cells that can develop and actually regenerate um, a neuron or these highways of communication in our brains so that we can still have some sort of uh, compensatory function so uh, we can compensate for things that we've lost in other ways or through other regions of our brain. Plasticity is where everything is kind of intact. You still have those sort of regions, but they reroute in a different way. It's not that they're newborn, if that makes sense. So these sort of cases before are really exciting for science. Oh, sorry, I didn't explain these pictures. <laughs> and the pictures, you have, these are neurons under a microscope. Really pretty. This is a nucleus, um, so the kind of head of where the message is being sent. And then uh, you, you get these sort of a the axons, which is the actual highway in red. And so here you can see where they're touching each other and they're communicating again where before they weren't. And this, you have the myelin, so the outer coating on, on your sort of highway of communication uh, that has been disrupted. This is an image, so the myelin is here. You can see it's nice and thick. And this is the image where it has remyelinated, or um, the myelin has grown back. It's a little bit thinner, but the point is, it's there again. So this is kind of, sorry, I'm not going to get too, too deep into this, but this is under the microscope, this is what it looks like. So you have these sort of axons. These are your highways of communication. Um, out the outer coating here, your myelin, and where the immune system has eaten away at that myelin here and left that axon bare. So the communication is a bit disrupted. In my research, I'm looking at um, mitochondria, which is our body's energy source. And uh, for mitochondria to work, it's very, very complex. I won't go into that. Um, but it, our bodies can't work without this, this element um, involved. And so uh, my research is looking at this, and we think that mitochondrial <coughs> dysfunction, or the fact that they're not working properly, might actually contribute to uh, the axonal loss, or the, the disruption in communication, um, which is really big in the kind of inflammatory world. Um, this is a picture of a person who has uh, inflammation <coughs> in their spinal cord. And so um, with this, this swelling, uh, the, we think the mitochondria is being activated from our dysfunction of being caused by this swelling and um, contributing to the disruption in the axon. However, uh, recent studies have shown that mitochondria are kind of upregulated, or or there's more of them in re remyelinated axons. So the, the axons where myelin has come back, um, there's more mitochondria there, which means that when 
there's an increased energy demand, and if we can meet that energy demand, then we can fix this problem. So back to kind of uh, what what it all means. So in the case of, of, of in this case where he had this sort of surge of creativity, this was kind of it happened on its own. His his neurons rerouted to from the back of his brain to the front of his brain, and he was able to kind of continue and express himself with his creative his creativity. However, we can also channel this. There's, there's cases where we can channel this um, ourselves. So um, there's a phenomenon called phantom limb when someone doesn't have a, an actual limb and she can put that part in, but they still feel like they have this limb. They still feel like it's functioning. They still feel that you know they, they, my hand has an itch in it, although my hand is not there. And so you can actually put them in front of a mirror with, with the, the limb that they have and um, somehow their, their brains can communicate and with, with the other side of the body that's not there uh, or with their, their neurons that aren't there and um, <coughs> fix whatever the problem that is that they're having. So whether it's, it's severe pain or um, you know, itching or something like this. So how is art therapy important? So um, Alan Brown is, um, started his art in the hospital. So he began uh, doing art when, where he didn't do art before in the hospital and um, kind of redirecting his, his energy to create this art. Sari Lynn, um, she says she was 19 or 17 years old wearing diapers and this gave her an outlet for her emotions um, and she was as she was trying to express her anger and different things um, that was happening, art was a huge outlet for her. And this is Sarah Ezekiel, where last year, she's on the board of Movement for Hope. She has motor neuron disease, um, and um, she's completely paralyzed from the neck down. In 2011, I did my first interview with her, and she said um, she used to study art history, and, uh, and M&D stole that pleasure from her. She used to love painting, but M&D stole that pleasure from her. In 2012, she's painting again um, because of some iGay software, and um, she just exhibited on the 6th of November at the Bloomsbury Theater with us. So art has a huge capacity and therapeutic value. It is an important step for healing um, process, whether it is actually tactile healing, so um, we're getting someone involved in different coordination. Um, mobility, different me memory activities, so tr tr triggering memory with, for example, music, um, or whether it's getting people involved in uh, different social aspects, again, or communication. It's, it has huge therapeutic value. So Robert Gupta once said, art offers the ability to transcend um, circumstances and remember that they have capacity to experience something beautiful. The humanity has not forgotten about them, and the impact of art itself has a, the possibility to transform <coughs> into hope. And so that's what I want to leave you guys with. I want to thank my team at Movement for Hope and um, my funders. Uh, and, uh, I'm interested in the cerebellum because that's the area that's been affected in me, you see. Um, you, you said that the cerebellum had been rerouted to uh, somewhere in front. We, we have if these sort of highways that I talked about, well, I'll just call them highways <laughs> or axons. Um, there's some that are still left. So uh, in evolution, as our bodies are developing, we have cells um, when, we're, when we're in our mother's womb that kind of differentiate or go into different regions and form this, you know, this is going to be an arm, this is going to be, you know, a brain, this is going to be the, the spine, different, different things. And so as that's happening, we still have maintained some of those uh, sort of cells in our, in our brains as we kind of grow, grow throughout our lives. And what happens is once they take, once they took his cerebellum, he still had a portion of those neurons left. And what they did was found another way to kind of communicate. That could have been, I'm not sure why, 
for example, they, they went to the prefrontal cortex or the, the front of the brain rather than to you know the other side of the cerebellum. That's something that's a bit unknown. But it was after the surgery, um, but they left the, the bits that they left there. There was enough there to reroute to somewhere else. It's not ex it's not as um, kind of straightforward as we'd hope for it to be. Um, but the fact that the brain is extremely plastic and resilient and can do that is is extremely kind of inspiring for me. At least that's the coolest thing about the brain. And but thank you for your most inspirational talk. But what I wanted to ask you is, in the course of your studies and research, how often have you found art used in any type of neurological condition or sort of mental proper art therapy? In, in my experience as a rep, very often it is used for children, but in the adult world, this is just not the case. I think that's true. Um, I think art therapy can definitely be used a lot more problem is is that it's, it's very difficult to say that um, because I took this art course or took this art therapy class it's a causal factor of my improvement so it's hard to draw that that tie together and I think because of that it's hard to get funding for something like this um, but things like dementia uh, for example art therapy particularly music therapy is used quite a lot um, because you can actually visually see um, that when you put someone's old music on that they liven right up and that is sustainable after you take the music away. So it can give <coughs> people back something um, that otherwise you can't give them back. Um, in terms of using art therapy purely, you're right, it, it's, it needs to be used a bit more uh, but there needs to be also in research ways to quantify that um, a bit more carefully than, than what we have at the moment. <laughs> Hi, it's not actually a question, it's just in agreement with you totally, um, a bit of a, this sounds like I'm promoting myself, but I am an artist and my son who had encephalitis uh, is a tattoo artist and his actual getting better was him focusing on his creative, he had to relearn to draw again and, and then everything, do you know what I mean? But it gave him that focus and it gave him that feeling that you know, and even neurologists and everything were amazed at how, by him focusing on that, the one minute he was couldn't do anything at all, and then he was focusing on that. And can I just add that I, I do believe that there's a lot more to find about it, but it's quite simplistic, all these researches and things like that. But we found, I gave him vitamins, magnesium, the stuff, you know, around that. And again, most of it, like you're talking about energy, is about positivity. And if we can just all hold on to that, and build on that, you know, that energy is what gets lots of us through all of this. Thank you. Right, well, if yeah. you join with me, just saying thank you again, Tam. For